This lecture is about interpreting microbiological results. There are a very wide variety of samples that can be taken from patients from different organs and tissues. And there's an even wider variety of tests that can be performed in the laboratory on these samples. And it's beyond the scope of this lecture to cover all of these. So we're gonna focus on three. The first is microscopy, then culture and antigen tests. Microscopy is usually the first test that's performed on many specimens when they reach to the laboratory. The information you can get from microscopy can be extremely important, but unfortunately it's often overlooked. Take for example urine, which is usually looked at under the microscope first. You may see white cells or red cells, and the absence of these is also important, as seen on this slide. You might also see eggs or ova, such as this schistosomiasis egg. Similarly, when you send a stool specimen to the lab, the first thing that happens is microscopy. And again, you may see white or red cells, and you might see ova, such as this trichurus egg. The gram stain is an example of a test which is readily available in microbiology labs. It can be done quickly and provide important information for the prescriber. It's, done, it's performed on a sample where first the bacterial cell walls are stained and then the sample is examined under a microscope. It can be performed directly on specimens such as sputum and CSF. This picture is an example of a gram stain of CSF showing gram-negative diplococci, suggestive of Neisseria meningitis, therefore alerting the clinician to the possibility of meningococcal meningitis. Gram stain can also be performed once the organisms have been cultured, for instance, when a blood culture becomes positive or a pus swab has been cultured onto a plate. The first thing that will be done is a, is a gram stain. This is an example of gram-negative bacilli, which can help guide empiric therapy. Our second results are culture results. It's important to understand that if a culture is positive, there are only three possible explanations. The first is that this represents contamination. Contamination is when microorganisms that did not originate from the intended anatomical site are present in the sample. The second is colonization. This is when microorganisms are grown from an anatomical site, but there's no significant inflammation and no true infection is present. And the third possibility is infection. This is when microorganisms are grown and there's an inflammatory response, and so true infection is present. So when interpreting a culture result, the first thing you need to ask yourself is whether you're dealing with a sample from a sterile or a non-sterile site. Sterile sites are blood, CSF, bile, urine, and the lungs below the glottis are sterile in health, although commonly colonized in people with chronic lung disease. Non-sterile sites are the skin, the GI tract, the vagina, and sputum is non-sterile as it must pass through the mouth, which is part of the GI tract. So considering a positive culture from a sterile site, the question you should ask yourself is, does this result fit the clinical picture? For example, if a pneumococcus, a streptococcus pneumoniae, is grown from a blood culture in a patient with pneumonia, then this clearly fits the clinical picture. And the result therefore very likely represents true infection. If however, you grow an enterococcus on a urine sample from a patient who has no urinary symptoms and has no white cells in the urine, this clearly does not represent a clinical problem and does not fit the clinical picture. And the sample represents contamination or con colonization. If you get a positive culture from a non-sterile site, your approach depends on whether the organism is normally present at that site. So in this case, let's take the example of a pus swab which has grown a Staph aureus. The question then is, is there inflammation? If the answer is yes, as in this case, where there's a patient with a wound who's got clear cellulitis around, if the pus swab grows a Staph aureus, then this is likely to represent infection. But if there's no inflammation present, as in this wound, if you took a pus swab from here and it grew a Staph aureus, 
Because there's no inflammation, there's no true infection, and this would represent colonization or contamination. You can see that taking a pus swab from the wound on the right is never likely to be beneficial because the wound will be colonized or contaminated with some organisms which will grow, but you'll not be able to act on them because there's no inflammation suggesting infection. You need a slightly different approach if you're interpreting a positive culture from a non-sterile site when the organism is not normally present. The approach is similar to that of a positive culture from a sterile site in that you need to decide if the result fits the clinical picture. In this case, we see uh, gram-negative diplococci from a urethral swab, which is Neisseria gonorrhea, and this does fit the clinical picture, and therefore infection is likely. Here we see a salmonella, and this is grown from stool in a patient who has no features of bowel infection. Therefore, there's no inflammation, it does not fit the clinical picture, and it likely represents contamination or colonization. Here are some more examples. Take a patient who's known to have TB, who spikes a temperature, and the intern takes a blood culture which grows a coagulase negative staphylococcus. The first question is, is it a sterile site? Which it is because it's from blood. The second question is, does it fit the clinical picture? The answer is no, because coagulase negative staphylococcus is not a common bloodborne infection. And there's likely to be another explanation for the fever because the patient has TB. And so this likely represents a contaminant. Take a patient with clear hospital acquired pneumonia. A sputum sample is sent and it shows a heavy growth of Klebsiella pneumoniae. Is it a sterile site? No, it's not because sputum is not sterile. Is the organism usually present at that site? No, it's not. Klebsiella pneumoniae is not commonly grown from sputum. Does it fit the clinical picture? Well, yes, it does because this is a heavy growth of an organism which is known to cause hospital acquired infection. So in this case, a sample taken from a non-sterile site is likely to be the one causing infection. Moving on to antigen tests. These detect antigens directly from specimens. They're usually very fast and cheap, and then can be very useful in antibiotic stewardship. Most are highly specific, and so rule in the diagnosis confidently when they're positive. But some of them lack sufficient sensitivity to confidently rule out a diagnosis when they're negative. Here are some examples. A rapid antigen test for group A streptococcus in children with sore throat can be used in primary care to reduce antibiotic use as antibiotics do not need to be given when the test is negative. We use Legionella urinary antigen because Legionella is a difficult organism to grow in the laboratory and so this test performed on urine can be very helpful. Meningococcal and streptococcal antigen tests on CSF are available. They can confirm the diagnosis when they're positive. However, when they're negative, they do not confidently rule out the diagnosis and so they cannot be used to stop treatment. In summary, there are multiple possible tests which can be performed on multiple different samples. Microscopy gives valuable information that is too often overlooked. Positive con cultures can result from either contamination, colonization or infection. And it's important for you decide, to decide which of these it is. Positive cultures must always be, be interpreted in light of the sample and the clinical details. Antigen tests offer rapid diagnostics that can aid antibiotic stewardship.